Welcome to Study, Grow, Know, where we discuss theology, prophecy, and current political issues from a conservative biblical perspective. Here's your host, Dr. Fred DeRuvo. I kind of started off last week by mentioning that we're obviously dealing with last day stuff. And um, what I think is fascinating is that the Bible speaks, roughly 30-33% of it deals with prophetic uh, situations. And it was important enough for many of the prophets to discuss it. It was important enough for Jesus to discuss it. It was important enough for Paul and other writers of the New Testament to discuss it as they were led by the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing how society tends to go through these cycles. Years ago, in the 70s, end time stuff was huge. And then it took a back seat, and it became huge again in the 90s, and it took a back seat. And it's fascinating, the reason I think it takes a back seat is because people don't, they get tired of looking forward or waiting for something to happen. So they think, well, it must not be the time. And yet, if you go back in Scripture, you look at the letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, for instance, and what did he say? What did they think? They thought that things were going to end in their particular decade. It didn't, and um, we should never put a time frame on things. But I really believe, honestly, I really believe a big reason why God places this stuff in Scripture is so that we will tune our minds to it. Not so that we become so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. You've all heard that expression. I do think though, quite honestly, if we have a proper focus on end times as it's presented in Scripture, it not only gives us hope, it gives us our marching orders as well, or at least confirms the marching orders that Jesus gave us in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And it helps us to get rid of and relinquish and let go of those things that are just not that important. And it is too easy for us, I think, to get caught up in all the stuff that's happening in society and we lose sight of the really important stuff, which we will see one day from a totally different perspective. But just as uh, by way of review, we looked briefly at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 last week, and we noted that Paul opened that whole section with basically announcing, I want you to know, give me your attention, because in the end times, they're going to be perilous times. Perilous times. Which, and you can, you know, we all know what the word perilous means, but it has to do with terrible, dangerous, unsettling, Mm. overwhelming time <clears throat> and I believe that obviously we also talked about the fact that last days what it meant for the church it meant from the first advent of Christ to his second advent and everything in between that's what it means for the church we're the church we're not Israel uh, you know I get so tired of reformers and covenant theologians constantly missing this difference and saying, oh well, the church has replaced Israel. There's no scriptural evidence for that. And the only way that can happen is when you allegorize scripture. So we need to stay away from that. God has a plan for the church. God has a plan for Israel. Salvation for both groups is always the same. Uh, it never, ever changes. Normative dispensationalism does not teach that Israel is saved with one method and the church is saved with another. It just simply does not teach that. The church in the last days started when Jesus was born. And then his ministry began some 30 years later and it lasted for three and a half years. And then we know the story. He was falsely accused, tried, convicted, put to death for our sin, rose the third day, ascended some 40 or 50 days later to the Father on high. Shortly after that, what happened in Acts? The church was yeah. born. Right. The church was born. And the church is going strong. 
Um, what I, is fascinating, though, is if you look at Christendom as a whole, and when I talk about <coughs> Christendom, I'm not, I'm including the church, but I'm talking about the visible church, which includes all Protestant denominations. When you look at Christendom as a whole, a lot of it is in sad shape, very, very sad shape. There's a lot of syncretism going on within the church. There's a lot of apathy going on in the church. There's a lot of social justice warrior mentality and selfishness in the church. But Christ's body, his church, is being built, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the same actually applies to Israel. God is doing something remarkable through Israel. Last week we briefly talked about the uh, peace deals. And even though those peace deals that are uh, occurring right now, in the Middle East are largely economic. They could very well be the, the starting point of what will become that peaceful quote-unquote situation uh, which happens within the tribulation where the Antichrist is able to step up to the plate and broker this wonderful deal which will actually allow Israel to build its tribulation temple. I have no idea how that's going to work. God hasn't told us. Uh, we just know it will happen. There will be a tribulation temple. And uh, I think it's fascinating that we've got three mosques sitting on the Temple Mount right now. So something's going to have to give. God knows what that is. But anyway, as far as last days, it means the church from first advent to his second coming. With respect to Israel, the last days means the period of the tribulation. The seven year period of the tribulation. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24 and he even actually emphasized what he called the great tribulation which is the final three and a half years of this seven year period and that begins, do you remember when that begins? That begins when the Antichrist creates the abomination of desolation. And there was a precursor to that, which I've talked about before, which occurred in 168 B.C. with Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And uh, he rose up and created this abomination of desolation in, in that year when he slaughtered a ton of Jews. Because, you know, it's just incredible the way it worked. He was on his way to attack Egypt, stopped on the way by Roman uh, centurions and messengers and they said if you do this you're going to be paying big time so he was rebuffed he turned his back on Egypt and then he decided oh I'll just walk through here and as he got through there he decided uh, this is the beautiful land where the Jews are I think I'll take my anger and frustration out on them so he did and it caused thousands of deaths and there was an abomination of desolation that became a pivotal point for <coughs> Uh, the Jews, and we read more about this in the apocryphal writings, First and Second Maccabees, and it's fascinating what he did. He just literally uh, created this abomination of desolation within the Holy of Holies for the temple that was standing at that time by placing a, a statue of Zeus, and some historians believe and state that he actually took um, a, an imprint or a copy of his face in a mask and put it over the mask, the face of Zeus. And then, of course, he slaughtered a pig on the altar, which made it, of course, obviously desolate, and they could not use the temple. So he literally stopped the sacrifices. The Antichrist is going to do the same thing. We read about that in 2 Thessalonians 2, and that will happen. But in Daniel chapter 2, this deals with the statues signifying the four <coughs> empires that are there and revealed to us, and it's just absolutely fascinating. The final empire, which is a derivative of the fourth empire, but some people call it the fifth empire, but it's really the fourth empire that com didn't completely go away. If we, if we look at history, even though the Roman Empire is gone, um, what's, what's fascinating about that is there are many aspects of the Roman Empire which continue to live today in many of the nations within, for instance, the European Union. And there's something else that's being built right now. There's a 10 Federation of States, which is actually starting to, to rise up there. So it's really kind of fascinating what's happening. And we also know that I believe it's Revelation 17, 
that um, John learns of the ten kings that have a short while to reign. And then the eleventh comes, we'll get into that, he comes up not out of their midst, but alongside of them. So he's not one of the ten, but he's the eleventh. And then he gets rid of three of them, leaving seven, so he becomes the eighth. This is also um, foreshadowed in Daniel as well. So it just, to me, absolutely fascinating. And if, by the way, I want to be very clear here. This, I'm not saying, and it does not mean that we're supposed to look at the news and interpret God's word from the news. We don't do that. What we do is we look at God's word, and then we look around and we go, well, is anything happening in the world today that could be reminiscent or fulfillment of this? And that's a very honest way to look at Scripture. But you don't look at the news and go, oh, I'm going to try and take this. And a lot of people do that. There's some real con artists out there. They are blinded by their own, I don't know what it is, but they're, they're not literally understanding God's word. They live in dreams. I mean, Jude talks about these people. They live in dreams and, and premonitions and all kinds of stuff, and they're totally incorrect. Uh, Jonathan Kahn, for instance, uh, my goodness, the man has been proved wrong so, so many times. But yet he continues to put out a new book. And anything else he said that was wrong, people seem to forget. And they still pump him up. I, I, there's no discernment. Lack, total lack of it. So this final empire will rise again, which is signified by the feet and toes, the, the last portion, the, the bottom of this statue. And we, we mentioned last week that the feet and toes are representative or represented by iron mixed with clay. And even though we don't know exactly what this means, based on what the rest of the statue means, it likely has to do with some form of government. So with iron, what was iron? Well, Rome was iron. What were they? They were an imperialistic form of government. They were ruled by Caesar. Caesar made the law. It was your job to follow the law. Period. That's imperialism. Today, we live in a constitutional republic. We don't have an imperialistic form of government. We have ways to redress the government and be critical of the government when they are stepping on our rights and our toes. Um, and that's perfectly legal. They did not. So what does it mean with clay? Well, we talked about the fact that it could mean a form of imperialism mixed with some type of democracy. And we can see how that would really not work. And so we don't really know for sure. And by the way, Jesus refers to a lot of this in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, when he talks about the birth pains. And uh, let's see. So now we're going to continue on. Turn with me to Daniel 12, if you would. Daniel 12, and I just want to read a couple of verses out of here first. If you haven't read Daniel in a while, I would strongly suggest that you read the entire book because we are going to be going through some of it. Daniel 12, 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. I think that's a fascinating verse. Thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Now, this was common. Anytime a prophet wrote down something, it would be legally sealed. And how did they do that? They would first, often, make an exact copy of their scroll. And then they would take the scroll, and they would roll it up very carefully, and seal it with wax and a stamp. And often, depending on what the uh, material used was, if it was a clay scroll, they would seal it at the bottom. So this was a very efficient, legal way of shutting something up. And what, what is God telling him here? Well, in, in large part, he's basically telling him, look, this is basically the end. I'm letting you know this, Daniel. But I want you to write it down because this is going to prove who I am. 
and prove my deity, prove my integrity. So I want you to write down everything. And, and it's really fascinating because numerous times um, Dan, we hear Daniel say, I, 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 I didn't understand what that was all about. And of course he couldn't. Can you imagine, if, can you imagine John? Mm. In, here he is being shown, and I don't know what God showed him, but imagine being shown the end of the age. You see big metal things flying in the sky. You see these big tanks on the ground. You see all these kinds of stuff. And you're John with this first century vocabulary and thought and education. And there's so much that you're seeing that you just can't pinpoint. You, yeah. you can't adequately explain it. So what did he do? He often used, he knew what was going on. Oh, that looks like a battle. That's a battle. So they're using armaments and bows and arrows. No, they aren't. But that's the way he explained it because that's what made sense to him. And so the same thing applies to Daniel. Daniel saw this stuff and often, like John, he was just completely overwhelmed. And he was like exhausted. And he was only strengthened when God or the angel would lift him up and speak peace to him or touch his mouth or this or touch his shoulder. And don't fear. But that didn't help him understand things better. It just simply didn't. And, and I want to emphasize this because we're losing, not we, the world is losing sight of this. They think they have it down. There are only two worldviews. God's truth or humanistic reasoning. This one never changes. Never. Never. This one is always changing. It is always being convoluted. It is always dependent on what happens in society. And if you know any leftists, I'm sure you do, I do as well, their reasoning forces them to conclude that truth is called from situations and circumstances. And those circumstances might be different tomorrow. Well, then we'll change tomorrow. But for right now, this is what truth is. And anyone who stands clear and fast here is seen by these folks as bigoted, you name it. <laughs> you, you, can, you can fill in the blanks there. But these are, there are only two worldviews. So these people... They are their highest authority. They are their highest authority. It doesn't get any higher than them. Oh, they may look to someone else who's quote-unquote an expert, but ultimately they're looking at other human beings and deriving their truth based on what they say, what they can be convinced of. Whereas for us, it's clear-cut. It's God's truth or no truth. That's the reality, right? And that's what we need to be willing to stand on, especially in this day and age with so many things happening that I think um, could very well be the things that are pushing us toward that final empire that Daniel first revealed to us in Daniel chapter 2. I'm afraid yes, sir. I was reading a while back and... Found out there's a distinction between secular humanism and mm. spiritual mm. humanism. Yeah. Secular humanism says there's no God, right? So do what you want to do, right? Spiritual humanism, and that's where we're trending. Yeah. Is I am God. I'm a <laughs> little God. Right. And so um, I've taken. I'm not only said there isn't a God, so you know, this, I'm ambivalent about that. To the place where I can make divine yeah. <laughs> jurisdiction yeah. over my life because I am a little God. And yes, you see that cropping up in not only preachers the way they preach. Oh, I know. But in, the, in kind of the philosophy out there, yeah, where we have not only dismissed God, we have taken this place. We have. Yes, and I see that because I'm so much uh, cognizant of uh, 
charismatic movement and NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. That's exactly what they do in there. They, they claim it's from God, but all their revelations and everything else is really, Jude would say, just from their own appetites, their own inner self. But that's what they base their walk on. And uh, they're becoming more and more aligned with the secular humanism of the world because those people, they think, we're, we're going to partner with these people and see how these secular humanists like and respect me because I like and respect them. And it's, it's just a sad situation, but of course we know that this is always the safest place to be. It's not easy sometimes to stand on that pillar, but that's the safest place to be. So everything in life stems from these areas. Now, men running to and fro, many shall endeavor to search out the sense. These are quotes. One is from Adam Clark, commentator from the 1800s. Many are going to endeavor to search out the sense, and knowledge shall be increased by this means, though the meaning shall not be fully known till the events take place. Place. And that makes perfect sense. Because even when you look at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, there's stuff there that's going on where I'm like, mm, man, I wish I could just wrap my brain completely around this. But it's not here yet. So we can't. And we're going to be gone before the tribulation <laughs> starts. So we're probably not going to see the bulk of these things. We're going to probably see more of the birth pangs and the evidence that things are starting to come to fruition. That may be it. Thomas Constable says, uh, attempting to understand these prophecies, people would search around and try to discover what they meant. And that's been going on since Daniel's day. That's been going on since Daniel's day. I was reading some commentaries, uh, like for instance, Adam Clark, and it's very interesting I have a great deal of respect for him, but it's really interesting he was still limited in what he could see because he lived in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have what we have today. Now things make more sense. So when we see in Revelation where uh, the, the false prophet animates the beast and every eye shall see it, we know exactly what that means. My phone, computer, television, boom, instantaneous. They didn't have that in those days. So, as time passed and knowledge increased, they would understand these things better than Daniel could. And we are in that position right now. 2,000 years, roughly, after Jesus lived and died, less than 2,000 years, roughly, since Paul lived and died, we are much further ahead in life to be able to understand what some of these things mean. And ultimately, what I think it means is it's going to find final fulfillment during the tribulation. But there's a lot happening in the world today which should embed us with this real true sense of our need to minister to godless people. To be always, as Peter would say, ready to give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ on paraphrase. And um, I think what happens is, and I know this is true of me, when I, I can get caught up in the frustration, for instance, with coronavirus, and some of the quote-unquote misinformation that I believe is out there, whether they truly don't know or whether they don't know and are trying to deceive, I don't know. But the, the point I'm trying to make is some of that stuff is frustrating. It's frustrating because you look to people who are supposedly the experts and you expect them to give you the truth. And it seems like maybe they just don't know what the truth is right now. So all that stuff is frustrating. But it's easy, what I, my point is, to get to that point of frustration and then forget that there are people who still need to know that Jesus is who he is, what he did for them, and what he wants to accomplish in their life. And I'll tell you, if situations like this don't bring that out in us, then there's a problem with us, a big problem with us that we need to address. And if that means standing before God or kneeling before God and not getting up until we figure out what it is we need to do, then we need to do that. So if we look at this, men running to and fro, this is an, a very interesting thing. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro. People are going to be running everywhere. 
And we've seen this, as I mentioned right at the start. In the 70s, end times was huge. I mean, I went to conferences. I would read books. I remember, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, Salem Kerbin, he wrote a book, wrote a number of books. Uh, Hal Lindsey's book, the big one, The Great Lake Planet Earth. I mean, all kinds of books. There were conferences galore. We were constantly going to these things because we wanted to know what, it wasn't that we were interested in science fiction. We wanted to know what did God's word say about this stuff. It's in there, so obviously God wants us to know. Well, then of course it died. And when did it come back? It came back after, uh, what's his name's book? Sorry, I forget his name. Tim Le LaHaye, uh, his book series, uh, the Left Behind series. That's when it started coming back again. And then it started to wane. And I think it's now coming back largely because coronavirus. So who says coronavirus didn't bring us anything good? If it helps us to focus on what God is doing, where he is planning this world to go, what what he is bringing to fruition here, then that's a good thing. But the first 6,000 years of civilization, look at this, transportation didn't change much. People walked, they rode beasts of burden, or they sailed on ships. That's for the first 6,000 years of life on this planet. You wanted to go someplace, and you didn't have a beast of burden, if no one was willing to give you a ride on their cart, this is what you did. Which is one of the reasons I think people were much healthier back then, often. As a society, obviously there were different examples and exceptions. But people walked. They walked wherever they could go. Now, we have, we have to remind ourselves to walk with our Fitbits. <laughs> you know? So when Sylvia and I were in California on our vacation, there were many days we would hike wherever. I was walking 24, 26,000 steps. You know, and it was like, wow, yes. But this is what people, how people got around back then. Since the 19th century, there was an explosion of technology. We've got railroads, steamships, automobiles, airplanes, space shuttles, satellites. I mean, it's just incredible. We're waiting for the next one. Which one? Uh, the transporter from Star Trek. That's what we're waiting for. <laughs> but I mean, really, you've got, look at this. These three options, that's it, versus these. Sometimes I'd love to have a horse. I keep telling my wife, I said, oh, I'd love to have a horse. I don't want to have to pay for the monthly dues, you know, 800 bucks a month just to feed it, whatever. But I just love riding horses. I just love it. I got to do that in California. And I just absolutely love it. But still, look at where we are. Automobiles that can go 100 miles an hour. I mean, it's just incredible, right? So imagine you're John or Daniel, and this is all you know. And then God gives you this vision, and you're seeing this stuff. And you're going to try and explain that. But we have no problem understanding it because that's what we live. Uh, my wife is reading the Little House on the Prairie books, and it is fascinating how they went from beasts of burden to the introduction of the automobile, and how that was such a huge, obvious change for them. Almanza Wilder, her husband, uh, was taught to drive a car by their daughter Rose because she was kind of obviously coming up the next generation. That was when she was more familiar to it. But she said her father was really hard to teach how to drive because he would get in the car and he would constantly mistake the brake for the gas pedal and when he wanted it to stop he would pull back on the steering wheel and, and go whoa and step on the gas <laughs> you know and step on the gas because when it you ride a wagon, wagon, wagon you have a brake here that's the only pedal you have so in his mind it was very very difficult to get used to for us not a big deal Another sign of the end times is the explosion of knowledge. This is absolutely fascinating to me when I was doing some research here. Up to the 1900s, knowledge doubled every century. Every 100 years, knowledge doubled. By the end of World War II, it doubled every 25 years. Now, you think that's something. Today, it doubles every year and a half. That is absolutely fascinating. IBM predicted a few years ago that within the next few years, knowledge would double every 11 hours. So we're living the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 12, 4. 
People will run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. That's what we're seeing in society. And this is very interesting to me, just as by way of example. The very first computer was built in 1951. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's called the Univac. It weighed 29,000 pounds. It took up an entire floor, an entire floor in an office building. It weighed 29,000 pounds and was incapable of doing what this does today. So, 1960s, what made this possible? This, the integrated circuit was invented. Today's laptops or desktops are millions of times more powerful than the Univac. But it's so interesting because we look at these things, we look at this, and I've said this before, this is like living in the days of the Jetsons when you FaceTime your family. When I was growing up as a kid watching the Jetsons, I thought, wow, that'd be so cool. And now that I'm doing it, I have to remind myself that's what I'm doing. But you just take it for granted. So all of this knowledge, and it has not only given us computerized knowledge and technological knowledge, but it has allowed scientists to discover the fundamental elements of the universe, which to me is actually pretty scary, knowing how humanistic many of these scientists are. They have actually believed they have discovered what they call the God gene, which allows people to note, to understand, to acknowledge God, and to worship God. Now imagine if these scientists were able to turn that gene off. Is that what the mark of the beast is going to do in tribulation times? Which would explain why those people will not be able to be saved once they take the mark. I don't know. I know that Bill Gates has talked about something like that. They've also been able to map the DNA of living cells. That is freaky. They're getting into God's territory. Yeah. They're getting into God's territory, which is scary. Because we know how corrupt and tendency of humanity is to be corrupt. So what good will ultimately come out of this? And by good, I'm talking about God's definition of good. They have brought us also more technology into global communications with satellites, internet, smartphones, smart appliances. You remember when the internet was first created mm -hmm. and you had to use the uh, modem. And the first modem was, what is it, 9600? And you would connect and you'd hear it mm -hmm. connecting and then dialing. And then you'd wait for that handshake, they called it. And now we hear nothing because we have Wi-Fi, which is through the air, made possible by satellites and cellular towers, and you hear nothing, it just connects, boom, you're there. Smartphones, smart appliances, very interesting what smart appliances are. They run on their own what they call Internet of Things. It's a completely separate network that is able to control the appliances in your home. This is why, for instance, PG&E just sent out notification to about 89,000 people, customers, saying You're, we're shutting off your electricity for the next three to four days. Climate change. So why can they do that? They don't have to go to your house anymore. They just do it by flipping switches. And their smart appliances on the receiving end get that information. And so they just simply shut down. Uh, they allow us to see the fulfillment of Revelation 11, 8 through 10. I'll turn there real briefly. Revelation 8, sorry, 11, 8 through 10. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Where, what city is he talking about here? Jerusalem. 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 Isn't that sad? This particular city, which is spiritually called Sodom and and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they, of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, shall see their dead bodies. And we're talking, of course, about the two witnesses uh, that God raised up specifically to minister to and call out, not just Gentiles, but primarily 
Jews from the nation of Israel who will become the final remnant. And those Jews will end up being the nation, the remnant, that fully inherits everything promised to Abraham during the Millennial Kingdom. But the tongues of nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Three days and a half. How long was our Lord's ministry? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. <clears throat> Connection, I don't know. I think it's interesting. So their, their bodies are just going to lay on the street. How are they going to see that? This. And uh, verse 10 says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets tormented them. Tormented them. Hmm. That dwelt on the earth. It's going to be like, uh, we were listening to this one sermon, anti-Christmas. Mm -hmm. Anti-Christmas. I mean, they're going to they're be so happy these two guys are gone. They're going to, but then three and a half days later, watch out. Uh, global rebellion against God's law. I'm sure you're familiar with Psalm. We won't turn there to read that, but you know that's the Psalm where it says, "The nation. Why do the nations rage?" rage? And God there is so compassionate, so loving, and so patient. And He basically says at one point, "Look, kiss the sun, kiss the sun." Kiss the same. He's, he, he laughs them to derision, scorn. Gentile kings and their people will unite in rebellion against Jehovah God and his anointed. And we see this. This does not happen in a vacuum. This is happening now. These are precursors to what's coming. And we know that he who withholdeth, or the restrainer, is keeping that abject, unfiltered, unadulterated evil at bay because Christ's body is still in the world. There will come a point where we are taken up. The Holy Spirit will not be taken out of the world, but removed to the side, just like the dam breaks and the evil will become truly evil truly evil. So the Gentile kings and their people will unite in rebellion. I mean, imagine millions and millions of people gone in an instant. And the rest of the world is going to be so happy. Oh, the malcontents are gone. Those people, thank goodness, thank God, oh, they're gone. The heathen are those who reject the God of the Bible, of any religion. They rage against God. They intend to cast away his bands and cords, which is another way of saying God's law. God's law was put there for our benefit, for the world's benefit. Most people hate it. They want to live as they please, not as God wants. And we're ending with this slide. This rage has grown exponentially. I mean, imagine how bad it was during Noah's day that God felt he had no other option than to destroy everyone in the world and all creatures in the world except for those on the ark. That's how bad it got then. Are we getting to that point now? Yes. Of course. It's yes. a redo. It's an absolute redo. It will culminate in Armageddon. And I was reading more about this. We'll get into this later. This is not just one battle. This takes place over a, 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 a space of about 75 miles, I believe it is, in Israel. And there's going to be a lot of skirmishes and battles happening pretty much at the same time. And it's found chiefly in the humanistic philosophy that we mentioned of the past three centuries. So it's really amazing to me how all this seems to be ramping up to a final, final showdown. And uh, I, I think it's happening in society now. We're obviously moving to that point, certainly. Any questions or comments? I think you really see that people live as they please today, and it's just about pleasing themselves, yeah. that they can steal and that that's okay, and that they can destroy and that's okay, because it's what they want to do. Yeah. So I think that just seems to be coming more and more evident all around us. Yeah. It is. It really is. All right, well, let's close on a word of prayer. 
You've been listening to Study, Grow, Know with Dr. Fred DeRuvo. Please join us each week for new broadcasts that deal with theology, prophecy, and political issues from a biblical, conservative perspective. 